Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this session. I'm Steve Wheeler. I'm from Plymouth University, and I'm chairing this session. And I'm very pleased to be sat here on the platform with uh, Gerd Leonard, who um, some of you will know from previous conferences here. He's, um, I, I suppose, when you look at his uh, profile on the web, there's all sorts of things you find out about him. He's a futurist. He's a, a media expert, and um, he's been involved in all sorts of projects. But I found something out about him today that has a lot in common with me, um, not just the black shirts, but, uh, but also I've discovered that he was a professional guitarist for 12 years and won the Quincy Jones Award. Uh, and that, that to me is amazing because that, that's five years more than I was a professional guitarist. So there's another thing we have in common. But uh, <laughs> we'll have to talk about that later on, about our, our, um, our mutual interest in music. But um, I'd just like to now um, ask you to welcome Gerd onto the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Steve. Thanks very much. Great pleasure to be here again. You are really gluttons for punishment to invite me again. So, first of all, I want to say, you know, last year in June, uh, I came back from a long trip to Japan, and I took my electric mountain bike, which is uh, basically a Viagra bike, people say, like a supported mountain bike. And uh, I crashed very heavily that same day. So if I have a funny lispling sound, that's because of my brackets and my 15 teeth that had to be rebuilt. I don't recommend mountain biking, but this is why I may sound a little bit funny. It's not intentional because I was drinking last night. I was, but it's not because of that. <laughs> so thanks very much for being here. So uh, first of all, I work as a futurist. Uh, many of you know what a futurist is. I'll give you basically my definition of a futurist. Uh, it's not about predictions, a crystal ball, or knowing stuff that you don't know. Uh, I spend my time looking at things that are happening in the next five years, 2020 roughly, so it's really about today. And I spend my time on those nascent things that most of you would know if, I, if we talked, but you don't really have time to look at it. So then I work backwards from 2020, and I try to help companies and people reinvent to get ready for that new tomorrow. Um, so one thing that's really important in the last uh, you know, 14 years or so, I've done uh, 1,650 keynotes and presentations. And I came to an interesting realization at the end of last year um, when I was in Brazil trying to chill and forget about my keynote speaking. Uh, I came to the realization that really what's happening today because of technology is becoming quite clear that the really important part about learning and about going forward is not actually technology or knowledge right, or data or information, because we all have lots of that. Right? And we have limitless information. We can watch any documentary on Netflix or BitTorrent or Hulu or you name, you name it, right? And we have TED Talks, right? <laughs> so, I and mean, we can get smart, we can find data, we can visualize, we can do all that stuff. It's becoming kind of a commodity data information, and some knowledge as well. And what is worse, or better, you could say, computer and robots are now having that knowledge as well. Right? You can use a, a software called Narrative Science to write articles for you. Right? They are writing articles for Forbes magazine. And you wouldn't know the difference. That's the worst part. Right? I'll show you some examples. So what is the future of learning? Right? It's becoming more human. It's not about becoming smarter, because we're all going to be very smart. We're all going to be able to tap into the smartness in the cloud also. And information and data will be ubiquitous. With a flick of a button, you can find out you know, what is the most likely trend to happen in Brighton in the next two weeks. You can find that out today with a flick of a button. Imagine that five years from now, 5.6 billion people on the internet. Every thought known to man, every medium, every information in the cloud, anywhere in the world. Intelligent software like Siri that you have on the iPhone or Cortana or Google can put this together for you. So what makes you human is not to beat those machines, right? You're not going to beat those machines. We're just not. Right? And when we use Google Glass or other things that, that amplify our mind, and we have brain implants, which is coming, now look at Black Mirror, right? The, TV show, how are we going to beat those machines? Oh, we can't. We can only be better by being more human. 
And that's what it's going to come down to. We heard the talk before, which was really amazing fit, and we didn't actually synchronize. But we're using a tool today. So if you have a smartphone and you have time to actually activate it while I'm talking and hammering you with information, <laughs> uh, inspiration, I hope, this is our platform. Uh, it's a website called Poll Everywhere. But it's, uh, I'm, the shortcut is futurediscussion.com. And you're welcome to leave questions there for me. I have it running here on my iPhone. So I can see your questions while we speak. And you can type anything you want, but please do keep it short. Okay. And of course, it's not on the internet, but it is public. So uh, you know, ask questions. We'll be showing them later. You can also tweet questions with a hashtag, right? LT15UK. And we'll be trying to answer those questions. We also have a poll later. It's part of my talk. I'm going to ask you what you think. So you will need to use this web address, and we're going to switch what you see there later as part of the conversation. All right, so first of all, we're now living in times of exponential change, right? times that are basically absolutely mind-boggling in terms of speed. Great book by my friend Yuri van Geest uh, and his colleague Salim Ismail from the Singularity University, which I have great concerns about, but this is a great book. It's talking about how our, our entire world has gone from going linear, you know, gradual, to exponential. The stuff that we thought was science fiction, automated tran language translation, gene therapy, nanotechnology, geoengineering, right? it's all within reach. So we're now at this takeoff point. And when it's about learning and education, that this is mind-boggling, because the tools that we're going to get, that we are getting now, are like having a rocket ship for the mind. And that's a good thing. But guess what? It's not enough to have a rocket ship for your head. Because then you, know, you get to be faster and you get to be, look smarter, right? But what's inside of the head? What is not in the head? What is in between the lines? So if we're looking at the stuff that's happening, is we can safely say, as the song says, you ain't seen nothing yet. The next five to ten years will be mind-boggling in terms of change. Great graph by my colleague Frank Diana. He talks about how all of these trends that you know about, they're actually combinatorial, which is a funny word. I, I didn't know it existed until he showed me. But it's meaning that it's all converging and coming together at the same time. So not only do we have all this stuff that could put the fear of God into you just by themselves, for example, the Internet of Things, cognitive computing, robotics, artificial intelligence, like reading like, like a script line out of Black Mirror, right, basically. <laughs> not only do we have that, they're actually all coming together. All coming together, converging, being exponential, interdependent. So if you're in the learning business, you need to know about these things. You need to know what's going to happen with uh, smart homes, the connected car, the smart grid, robotics, and so on, because technology will impact every single level of this conversation. And the other thing we have to know is this. We're going to have to figure out what's right or wrong. And that answer isn't black or white. It is a it depends answer. If I can get a quadriplegic to walk again by having giving him an external skeleton, which is possible, cost about a million pounds, eh? and control that mechanism with, the, with his mind. That's fantastic. But the same technology is used for a battalion of soldiers to be able to throw a car over the mountaintop. Right? Same technology. And that is our future, right? It's basically like nuclear power can be used for destruction or possibly for energy, if you agree with that. <laughs> So we have to think about that, too. We have to think about technology and if it's right or wrong, and what purpose does it serve. A technology that serves itself has extreme catastrophic potential. Yeah, because it basically is self-perpetuating. It gets stronger by the minute. In a way, we have this already with Google and Facebook. Right? They're self-perpetuating. And we're sort of landfill for them. At the same time, we still get good benefits. So it's kind of a, you know, I call it sometimes hell then, you know, hell and heaven. It, it's kind of both. So here's a, here's a future that we're going to see because, you know, in the next five years, going up to doubling the amount of people that are connected to the Internet. <coughs> at a lower price, at much higher speed, everything in the cloud. Right? We're talking about a world that is like warp drive. Right? 
You think it's crazy now? Give it some time. <laughs> if you have kids, you got to think about this. Their future is not going to be linear. They're going to have to be exponential thinkers. And you know, humans can't be expo exponential. I mean, you're not going to live faster because you tweet. Right? You're not going to be more social because you have all these friends on LinkedIn. This is just not humanly possible. We're not set up to be exponential. In fact, we're completely inefficient as machines. Because we lie, we cheat, we make stuff up, you know. You name it. We're inefficient. So what happens here is we're going into a future that's VUCA, as the military calls this VUCA. Velocity, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I mean, look at politics. I live in Switzerland. One day the Swiss bank decides that today we're going to do away with a fixed euro Swiss franc conversion. That was two weeks ago. I lost 20% of my company's assets. They just decided, okay, we've done it long enough, I'm going to change. And Switzerland is like now in a, in a huge period of change. Look at terrorism and all these things. Our future is going to be more of that, not of terrorism, hopefully, but of this VUCA. Look what that does to the venture capital markets, for example. You can see here how quick companies have, to have reached a $1 billion valuation over time. And now you have Airbnb and Dropbox and Uber reaching $5 billion. You know, Airbnb is bigger than the Hyatt Hotel chain and Hilton Hotels together in terms of valuation. So that's speed. We have to get used to that idea and what it does to us. So in a way, we have this triple scenario. And, and I, last year, I asked you to think hybrid. Right? Think of today, think of tomorrow at the same time. That's already bad enough. This year, I'm going to ask you to think triple, tribrid, whatever. Is there a word for that? You have to think about the past also, right? the present and the future. And the biggest problem is, I think, for many companies that you're working with or that you're working for or companies that I work with, as Gary Hamill says, the single biggest reason that companies fail or people fail is that they overinvest in what is as opposed to what might be. I mean, think about that for a second. This is difficult because it's always safer to invest in what is. This is a huge cultural challenge. In the UK, you're sort of in between the US extreme cowboy uh, capitalism and the European or German way of saying, now we don't want to take any risks. Yeah. So you're kind of lucky there. But you have to invest in what might be. This is a key thing. So when you're in the learning sector, development, training sector, you have to think about what may be two or three years from now. And you have to anticipate this, not 20 years. Yeah. This is part of our work. One thing that's happening right now is that uh, all of a sudden, old traditions that we worked with for a long time, that were valid for a long time, are being reversed. One example is the car business, Tesla and now Toyota. I think it's Toyota, right, the example. To where they all of a sudden said, okay, we're getting into electric cars because that is the future. It's painful to realize this after you have all these big gas guzzling BMWs. Now it's electric cars. So these companies have said, what we're going to do is we're going to publish all the patents, all the trademarks that we have, and we're going to give them away to people who want to build batteries and electric cars because, and this is very American, of course, the rising tide floats all boats. In Germany, they would prefer a, prefer a river that floats their boat. It's just a comparison of culture, of how we look at things. So now this, these people have reversed. They have spent billions of dollars on, on patents to come up with better batteries. Every month there's a new innovation. And now they're going to give them away for free. Billions of dollars. Think about that with the pharma business, you know. Medications, Pfizer, Novartis. This is the worst fight in the world are about those patents. Every country in the world from Brazil to India is fighting those patents, right? The reverse. So, in many ways, when you think about what you do, can you reverse one of those assumptions and start things from, from scratch? Tesla is now selling five times as many luxury cars in the US than Mercedes and BMW combined. I don't know how long they have to keep up. You know, they're going to have to really perform to make that work in the long run. 
Of course, there's on, you know, in Silicon Valley, there's one on every parking lot, but... So, reversing assumptions. You know, HBO in the US, the, the cable TV chain, they said for a long time, you're not going to be able to watch HBO over the internet, because if you do that, you don't buy cable. And you do have to spend the 100 quid to get cable to get HBO. I think the same deal here, right, basically. Now, four weeks, and we discussed, I, I discussed with all these guys years ago the, the fallacy of this idea that you can coerce people because you know what they do is they just find the movie somewhere else. Right? It's not hard. Right? Or you get an IP tunnel to be on Netflix or whatever. Right? So they decided in their wisdom four, four weeks ago or so to put HBO on the Internet. You can watch HBO on the Internet now. Right? Because they had to reverse the assumption. The assumption was, if we, do, if we do this, we lose the cable guys. But turns out, if we don't do it, we lose everything. And this is the thing about beliefs and ethics. Sometimes it's good to take a step back and say, if I didn't believe this, what would I do? If I didn't believe this was so true, could I find something that is actually happening? This is a very hard thing to do because it splits your mind in two halves think about what could be if you believed it to be different. So this is what happening, what's happening today. Every single day of our lives, there's more of this. Technology and humanity is overlapping. Some people say it's converging. Ray Kurzweil says, the advent of singularity, where machines become as powerful as people, is in 2029. And this has been a topic of many, many movies and discussions. Right? But you see this every single day. Essentially, we are already outsourcing our thinking to our mobile devices. How many of you forget the phone numbers of, their, of your friends or family because they're stored in the device? Right? How many of you would look somebody up on LinkedIn when you go to a meeting, but the person is sitting right next to you in the office, and right? you're looking at their profile. It's outsourcing your brain. Using an app like Google Keep. I mean, this is ridiculous in a way. Right? We use an app to keep stuff for us that used to be kept here before. Right? Or we use an app to remind us that, you know, how we brush our teeth. This was a big deal at CES. Uh, Oral-B has a toothbrush that connects to your app. Right? So it monitors how you brush your teeth. Right? And of course, you can share that. I think you can share images. I don't know what it is, but yeah. Insane, right? outsourcing ourselves. So maybe we get to this point. You may recognize this scene. We have some audio on this. Can we get some audio? Sorry, got to play it again. Crank up that audio. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. <laughs> you may remember this scene from uh, Space Odyssey, right? Where the computer decides that no longer, you're no longer in charge. We may get to that place if we don't think about what technology actually is and what it does. So it won't allow us to come into the station anymore. The self-driving car could decide that you're not fit for driving. It's obvious none of us are really fit for driving compared to a machine. Right? I mean, none of us are fit to fly an airplane. Did you know that it's already quite clear that if airplanes were completely flown by mechanical pilots, by robots, they would actually be safer? Right? That's already very clear. So lots of debates about this, how technology is changing what we do and how technology is changing our perception. And perception is very important for us because we work on visual imp impulse, right? We work on images and read between the lines. So this is about to change forever because now augmented reality and virtual reality and seeing things differently is here. And this is, this is amazing news for education and for learning and for training. Right? Because now you can visualize, you can see things, you can go inside, you can immerse. Because the worst part about doing stuff on the internet so far has been that, you know, it's, it's very like, 
It's data, it's information, it's flowing constantly and dumping stuff onto you, but you can't really get inside. Yeah. Now we have new technologies allowing us to go inside. This is a Google investment called Google Leap, Magic Leap, sorry, not Google Leap. They invested in this company called Magic Leap. And what they do is they're inventing a, a technology that allows people to see augmented reality in real life without wearing anything projecting images and stuff that come out at you, essentially augmenting our real-life reality. You think this is science fiction? Give it two years. Now you have the kids staring at their mobile phones while you have dinner, right? Think about the future. You'll be having dinner with the augmented hologram. <laughs> Maybe they'll teach them how to eat as well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but this is the reinvention of seeing things. And you can bet, of course, every single technology company in the world is putting billions of dollars into this, because if they can change our interface, everybody would want this. Right? It's addictive, clearly. It's even much more addictive than anything we have today, which is already worse enough. So the next step from this is the Oculus Rift, acquired by Facebook. If you can, you should try it. It's a pretty clumsy helmet. right? You can go inside of a virtual reality and. Uh, and basically, this allows you complete immersion, for example, for games, for learning, for, for uh, fixing your motorcycle, for having conversations, for having cyber sex, you know, all these interesting things. Uh, you can be literally augmented. And Facebook says they want one of those in every Facebook user's house. They're making it so cheap, it'll be cheaper than a mobile phone. You think this is weird, or it just looks weird now, but <laughs> wait till it looks better, right? Will we become perpetually augmented? Will you have a disadvantage as a teacher if you're not augmented? Anyway, I could say that now I'm augmented by my technology, right? Or I, you know, I take a cholesterol pill, that's not a big deal, right? Well, for some people it is, but that's already an augmentation. But this is gradually, in order of magnitude, much, much bigger. Right? Here's the newest thing, came out two weeks ago. Microsoft HoloLens, the most successful attempt at creating holographic information in front of your eyes. You can check it out. This is not a commercial. Microsoft is not a client, thankfully. But this is the video. Look around. Technology is all around us. We use it in every aspect of our lives. It enables us to do amazing things. But what if we could go further? What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. More immersive ways to play. Well, you get the point here. I mean, obviously, the world isn't colored until Microsoft arrives, right? <laughs> That's the key message, which is interesting. Right? So is this, is this, this is not even the future. This is today. Yeah, it will take some time before we can all have this. Right? I mean, this is probably positively addictive. So what happens with technology here is, is truly a curse and a disaster. Right? I mean, a, a curse and, and a blessing, sorry. I, no, I actually have a double, a double negative here. But uh, what happens here is that we, we can think about this and say, yeah, this would be amazing. I mean, if I want to learn how to fix my motorcycle, YouTube is pretty cool, but now I, you know, now I can do it with other people in other places, and they virtually help me. Think about how user-to-user -user interaction could change. And we talked, you know, we heard the keynote before, what could happen remotely, right? With medical training and health and, you know, could be godsend. The HoloLens, imagine this for learning and training. Now you see a bit of the future, how we can do that. And just imagine, you know, remember that five years ago, we thought about mobile devices and mobile apps. That was a kind of a, a, a blue sky, uh, you know, we, we, we could do this a pie-in-the-sky kind of idea, right? Now it's everywhere. Now using that stuff has become as normal as using SMS. Right? So 
That's how changes happen, how quickly that happens. And this is truly hell then. Hell and heaven. So it's up to you to make this heaven. It's not up to technology to decide what that is. If it was up for technology, we would be in hell very soon. Because clearly it makes a boatload of money to do that, right? To replace people with machines. That makes a lot of money. To go inside of our heads and take them over and upload our brain, that could probably make a lot of money. But the question you have to ask, which parts of that are actually helping us to be human, not replacing us to be or making us into machines? And so when we look at uh, the future of learning, we're looking at this and saying, okay, scenarios like this, this is Qualcomm, a chip company, uh, showing augmented reality at CES 2015. Co they call it connected everything. interesting the motto you know which uh, apart from the sort of uh, pinball music that I really appreciate on these kind of clips is also the quote at the end right it says Qualcomm why wait that's an interesting question well why do we wait because sometimes there's sense in waiting right there's also sense in doing nothing sometimes or slacking off being a slacker. I mean, there's a big thing about this discussion of what it does to people not having any boredom, you know, not being able to digest. So this is one of those discussions about this, and this is actually from Black Mirror, which you should watch. You know, it's a really amazing TV show about the stuff that we're looking at in the near future. Quite scary, and I will eventually have a more positive note at the end. You know, I'm not going to have only negative things to say. <laughs> The question is, do we use technology for its own sake? Right? Is more and faster and free always best? And the answer really is, for me, is that many things that we do, having more technology and being faster and cheaper is absolutely amazing. Right? That, we want that. Right? And also, of course, it's unstoppable. Right? So it, it's just there. I mean, if, if you use cloud computing, you're going to be faster, you're going to be cheaper, so you use cloud computing. But the question we have to ask, and you know, ultimately, is, is there a point where enough is enough? Right? Where we're removing stuff that we shouldn't, and this clip from Black Mirror kind of shows it. Live more. Connect more. Travel more. Share more. Smile more. Find more. Consume more. Think more. Experience more. Remember more. See more. Share more. Remember more. Learn more. Make more. Well, we all know, of course, the new more is better. Right? Really. Because there's a limit to how much more we are going to take. Right? Great book that just came out. I have lots of doubt about some of the theories, but it's this book. The internet is not the answer. And actually, I don't agree. I think the internet is the answer for some things, right? So I will put this in the corner down there. Y you should read this book because it brings up some of those interesting questions right? and what actually happens with us down the road. So the question to me is, and I found this really interesting article on, on Aeon, is what good is information? The internet promised to feed the minds with knowledge. What have we learned that our minds need more than that? What do our minds need? Right. Experiences, feelings, emotions, right. things that are not expressed with numbers. That is true learning. Right. Not to say that the other part isn't learning, it is, but it's just different. I mean, you know fully well if you go on TripAdvisor to check out a restaurant right, or to, to check out a location, it's interesting, but it's not real. It is an approximation of real. Right. That's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But don't confuse the two. Right? Just the fact that you have that connection doesn't mean it's actually the same thing as actually being there, even if you use virtual reality. So the question here really is, as the previous speaker said, dematerialization, automation, 
augmentation, virtualization, all the stuff that's inverbally coming. There's not much we can, we can't just pull the plug on that, right? This is happening all around us. And this could be the Oxford study from two years ago uh, said that we may lose as many as 50% of jobs because of these trends. 50% of traditional jobs being augmented away. For example, at the airport, you no longer have people taking the luggage in most places like in Amsterdam. You just throw it into a hole, right? You do it yourself. <laughs> and you go there and you just kick the one and it goes off, no more person. In Germany, it's already like 30 or so sushi restaurants where you don't have waiters. You have an iPad and you, you type in the order, it goes off to the kitchen and you have two people bringing it out. So wait stuff reduced from 10 to 2. And on it goes, right? So there's also a good lesson here, of course. We have a huge amount of, of demand for new jobs rising from all of these things. Right? And we will have huge demand by going back to what I call rehumanization of technology and of the workplace. So I tell my kids when they think about their future, do something that makes you irresistible, that can, where you become indispensable. Right? And how do you do that? Well, you don't do that by being better with numbers. Right? Well, it depends how creative you are with the numbers, of course. Right? But, so there, it depends. But basically here, you have to become more human, right? You have to become more creative, more imaginable, more interesting. You know, all the things that can be digitized, you know, if you're looking at all of the things that already become digitized, like call centers, we're talking about 100 million people here. 100 million people. Software will replace every single person in those call centers except for the top 1,000. Right? Voice recognition. Artificial intelligence, boom, 100 million people. I mean, we're already talking to computers when we call call centers, right? Think about that future. McKinsey had a report from three years ago already talking about the auto automation of knowledge work. And I think what's happening here is that actually it makes us humans more powerful, right? Riding on top of that trend. Right? As long as we are aware of what's happening here and where our, where our muscle will be in the future. That is a very, very interesting thing that we're seeing. In many ways, having all this stuff, all these sites, like uh, this new place that I just found, the, the uh, plural, plural site, website for training, in many ways, it's a nirvana. So if you want to know about math or you want to figure out stuff, you can do that all here. It's all available. It's a nirvana. But on the other side, right, our brain is outside of our body now. We, we've moved the process of imagination and learning from us into this outside space that is owned by the big internet companies, technology companies, uh, cloud providers, you name it. And that is not a bad thing as long as we remember that most human learning will still need a body. If you watch the movie Her, right? have you seen the movie Her? No? It's about artificial intelligence, a guy falls in love with the operating system on his computer. Right? Spike Jones. So that movie shows you, in the end, the woman who's inside of the computer, of course, who was, uh, what's her name, the Swedish actress? Yeah, Scarlett Johansson. Uh, she's inside of the OS. And at, at one point, he says he's in love with her, and she says she's in love with him. And then he asks her, how many more people do you have these kind of relationships with? And she says, at the moment, 4,734. Right? Because she, she can do that. She's the computer. Right? So our learning, our future still needs a body, it needs the senses, it needs other people, it needs an inefficiency, serendipity, accidents, boredom. And that's part of our future. We, we don't want to remove that because it's inefficient. Right? And this is the issues I'm having with technology sometimes. It's like quite clearly, you know, self-driving cars would make the world safer and save lots of people from dying on the streets. Right? And so would be cutting out alcohol and cigarettes and you name it. Right? But where do we end up <laughs> if we go there and automate in this way? Cognitive computing. This is a short trailer by IBM. I can't really show most of it, but it kind of shows you what cognitive computing is. Computers that are starting IBM's to think. IBM's Watson is at the right? forefront of a new IBM's era of Watson computing. is doing that. Cognitive right? computing. It's a radically I mean, new kind of computing. If you're in the learning very business, the that very term, cognitive computing, should, should give you something to think about. Right? A thinking computer. So where are we going with this? You know, the question I have for you, how deep 
will we go inside machines uh, and the machines inside of us? What's the direction of this? This is an important question. I think to find that balance and to find that nexus to where we can say here is a good point and after that is not a good point will be crucial for our work, for our future. Marshall McLuhan said, first we make the tools and then the tools make us. So that's something to think about and to further that thinking, I'm going to ask you to take out your weapons, the, the smart devices. Yes, you have to actually use that now. And uh, this is the audience interactive part where we're going to go to the poll. I will check on those questions shortly. Okay, go, please go to futurediscussion.com on your mobile browser, futurediscussion.com. Okay. Here we are. I'm activating it now. So this is actually very easy. Futurediscussion.com works on every mobile phone. Okay, are you seeing this now? Okay, it's very easy. You just push your finger to vote. You can only vote once, okay? If you don't have a smartphone, you can send SMSs to this number, or you can use Twitter. The question I have for you, how do you feel about the rise of increasingly intelligent software and apps. Cognitive computing, if you would understand what that actually is, it's not easy to understand. <laughs> and self-learning robots. How do you feel about the future of learning and machines, basically? Yeah. So, variation is, it's all just amazing and good. And the last one is all the way down. That really worries you. What is the future of humans? So I'd like to get some sentiment here. And, you know, I know there's a roughly about 110 people or so in this audience, so if you get less votes and you have not used your weapon, and that cannot be forgiven, you will be deleted. Uh, all right, so that's very interesting. We're getting lots of votes. That's good. I kind of figured you would be sort of in the mid-range, in the upper mid-range, and mostly good developments, but let's not get too carried away. We also have a lot of worried people. And you know what? This is a good thing. Because if we weren't worried, we wouldn't take the right measures to go forward. It's part of what we do. It's not a good motivation to be scared right? or to act out of fear. So it's very important, I think, for us is to look at these issues and decide what will they do to us, but to not get stuck in fear. Because fear is usually an anti-reaction, you know, a shutdown reaction. Right? We have to move forward into that future. Oh, we have even more. You know, so of course, the more critical people are the last ones to vote. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> okay, I will publish this result later on so you can see it in my slide deck. I'll, I'll put the PDF up t today. And this is, of course, anonymous, except for that we captured all of the information on your mobile phone in the process. <laughs> all right, let's go back to this here. You, you may have seen this really amazing cartoon. It says the most intimate moment in people's lives now have changed. It used to be when you ask your wife or your husband to marry you. Right? You'd sit on the beach and have this conversation, and uh, she would say, say it, please say it. You know, I, you know, I'm crazy about you. And the guy says, uh, in the end, he says, will you add your fingerprint to my iPhone's touch ID? <laughs> right? The ultimate display of trust is <laughs> access to our mobile brain. And this is how the world has already changed, and, and we can ask a simple question, you know, as Marshall Malatun says, first we build the tools, then they build us. And some of that is, I think, inevitable, but we have to ask this question now that knowledge is moving from us into the network. The cloud is becoming smart because of us. Every time you use Siri you know, on the iPhone, they analyze your voice, they record everything you say, and they combine with other locations around you and so on. So the cloud grows infinitely smarter by our contribution. And that's also kind of like it, it's moving into sort of a, a knowledge OS, right? And language is no longer a barrier. You've seen this app from Google. It's kind of like say hi. Bonjour, comment puis-je vous aider? Hello, how can I help you? This is a real-time translation app and say hi does the same thing. Just went live on Google Translate. Language is no longer a barrier. I mean, how will that impact your business? Imagine that. Imagine that all the clever stuff you think about here 
you can offer in Chinese and vice versa in real time. You think this is science fiction? Well, it's already working now, but it takes a little bit longer to scale on a very large level. But language is becoming less of a barrier, and of course, will our children still learn languages or just walk around with a plug in their ear or in their head to learn those languages? Then we have wearable computing, which is the, the, the craze of the last you know, 12 months is wearing stuff that connects to the internet. And what it does basically, you know, we're, we're very likely to sort of have a direct connectivity of our brains and neural systems. What will that do for learning? More information in the cloud, more discussion, more possibilities, and wearable internet of things that, that reminds us to do things. Increasing incentives to outsource. The, the, the refrigerator calls out to us, say, don't forget to buy the milk. Google Keep reminds us of how that works. And then we have Amazon came up with a new thing called the Echo. And this is a box that sits in your living room that is your warden and your reminder of real life. Here's a short clip. When it first arrived from Amazon, I didn't know what it was. What is it? You'll see. Is it for me? It's for everyone. It's called Amazon Echo. How's it going? Uh, I'm just finishing up right now. Is it on? Oh, it's always on. Can it hear me right now? Uh, nope. It only hears you when you use the wake word we chose. Alexa. Well, what does it do? Alexa, what do you do? I can play music, answer questions, get the news on weather, create to-do lists, and much more. Awesome. Huh. Alexa, play rock music. Rock music. Alexa, stop. Wait, I want to try. Alexa, what time is it? The time is 3.27. You actually don't have to yell at it, oh. okay? It uses far field technology so it can hear you from anywhere in the room. So oh, you get the point, right? And this is really serious. Amazon <laughs> wants you to have this thing in your house. Yeah? So they actually call it hearables, like wearables now, they're hearables. Yeah? So uh, this book, the click, I think uh, Evgeny Mozorov said, ignorance can be dangerous. We know that, of course. Right? but so can be omniscient, knowing everything. And that's the balance that we have to take in the future. We have to figure out, you know, are we really, is it, is it human to have omnipotency, to be omnipresent, to have omniscience? Is that human? Is that desirable? And that's the nexus that we're on right now. We have to figure out ignorance and not knowing stuff and not being able to do things, of course, is a deadly thing, yeah? clearly. But the quest for the opposite is probably the same. So you can say in many ways, you know, hyperconnectivity is the new opium. The internet is the new drug. And, and like all drugs, you know, cigarettes or alcohol or whatever, you know, some of it is probably not so bad if you, if you can manage it, right? It's not a black or white question. But will the future of learning still need periods of digestion, contemplation, introspection? Now, this is human. And we cannot just take that out. I mean, this is the kind of wormhole idea that we can have all of the intelligence and knowledge and take a bypass that skips 98% of the effort. They have a download of, of that knowledge. That's not possible. It's not real. Right? It's an approximation. That's not a bad thing, but it's not real. What will remain uniquely human? That is a question. And I think it's, it's really interesting to see IBM came up with a bunch of things on this future of knowledge, and they have this graph depicting, very important, I'll, I'll show a clip on that shortly, is that we're moving up this pyramid from data to information, knowledge, wisdom, and intelligence. And intelligence is not intelligent in the sense of knowledge, but emotional, social intelligence, human intelligence. And for machines to match that is at least 30 to 50, if ever, years away. If you're emotionally and socially intelligent, and otherwise as well, that's the future. Right? I think that is something we have to look at, you know, as, as this clip uh, demonstrates pretty well here, in this pyramid, the sort of Maslow-derived uh, uh, pyramid, we're moving up to that last part. And that's where our efforts have to be. <laughs> you can call that wisdom if you want to be more ephemeral. Uh, it's something that is not expressed in zeros and ones. It's something that takes you to the very top of that 
I think human learning is inevitably going in that direction. So the future of learning for me is going from data and information, and I would rather say through data and information, because we, we do have to go through that. You know? We cannot do without that. But to go through it, to transcend it into knowledge and ultimately some sort of realization, some wisdom, you know, or beliefs, or whatever you want to call it, something that is uniquely coming out of that process, some invention, you know? some realization, something that only you can do. So there is a trend towards the idea of saying, now if you look at this, sort of data is outside of me, information moves into me, knowledge is close to me, but wisdom is inside of me. And that is the future of learning. How do we do that? How do we support people in that process? It's not by dumping waterfalls of data on them. It's by immersing them in experiences. Whether they are virtual or not, they are just different levels of the same thing. The future of work is a return to this, right? It's a return to the right brain. This is the right brain that we lost in the industrial society when it was preferable for people to act like robots, basically. You know, when I, I, I didn't study business, I studied music, but I had the fortune of having some friends who, who were studying you know, business 30 years ago, and I could swear when I talked to them, I was thinking, like, this is really robotic. The, the battle plan for when you roll out the business and get the money back, the return on investment, you know, all, the, all these things. It's, like, it's very much like, like a plan, like a, like a uh, military operation. And now we're going back to a place to where we need to rediscover what's inside of here. Right? Subjective reasoning, imagination, negotiation, questioning. Very, very important, I think, for the world to rediscover that. Kevin Kelly, riffing off Socrates, said, Machines are for answers, humans are for questions. And that is what we want our people to learn, the ones that you tried to train for their future. You want them to ask questions. Yes, they have to provide answers. And I get this all the time when I speak to people, they want answers, right? They want recipes, they want... You go to the doctor, the doctor gives you an injection, you walk out of there in two minutes, it's fixed, right? But real life isn't like that. If you have a real medical problem, you're going to have to do more than get an injection. I mean... There are shortcuts at times. You can take an Advil against headaches, right? That's kind of a shortcut. You don't have to go to therapy to fix your headache. But you have to ask questions. You have to look beyond the obvious. You have to actually use that part of your brain again. Great slide here from, um, I think it was uh, uh, Jacob Morgan. And you can download the slides later, by the way, on my website, futurewithgerd.com. If you have trouble remembering my name, G-E-R-D, it's like gastrointestinal reflux disease. Same thing, <laughs> right? Futurewithgird.com. So, uh, the principles of the future organization. And of course, I think if you're looking at this chart, you would all say, yes, 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 yeah, that's what we have to do. But let's be clear about this. This requires a reset of your brain. The brain that says, I've learned the following the last 25 years. You know, a fish didn't invent, invent water. Right? A fish is in the water. It's very hard to go outside of your brain and say, well, if I didn't believe that then, X, Y, Z. Right? We have to do a reboot for this. We have to question this. And you know how you do a reboot. Either you're forced because the old system is collapsing, or you discover something really powerful that gets you excited and gets you to drop, right? And the third part is by basically saying, I'm going to stop doing this until something else takes the void, right? Comes in and replaces this. So I think this is very important for our future. Look at all these points, flatter structures, storytelling, more women in management roles, the cloud computing, the idea of fast ad adoption. Right? These are all things that are kind of ubiquitous now. Bringing that over to the right brain. So I'll, I'll finish with this, you know, I think the future of learning is, yes, awesome technology. We need that. And that is crucial for a lot of reasons. But we also have to be awesome humans. We cannot let awesome technology take over humanity. Yeah. And we can't refuse technology because it's making us more powerful. And we can do stuff. But in the end, it comes down to this thing. How in this world are we going to find the way that it actually makes us more human. 
And that's where learning comes in, right? teaching us to become more human, not to teach us to become machines. Thanks for your time. We're going to have a discussion. Please do ask questions. There's some tweets here. We'll try to get back. Thanks very much. <laughs>
And we can't just say we're not part of it. I mean, you can. You know, move to the mountains of Switzerland or, you know, Amish country. Even there, of course, they have mobiles. But we have to find a way to make adjustments to what fits and what does not. Right? We have to have choices. And that's what it comes down to. I think that clearly, if you're looking at all of these things, you know, the, the business potential is gigantic. I mean, it's uh, positive. There's, there's another question at the back just over here. Um, perhaps you could pass the mic along there. What are your thoughts on the dangers of early adoption and technology and exponential technology growth leading to exponential obsolescence? Uh, Google Glass being an example of where they decided that, that it wasn't you know, viable for them to continue on that project. Well, again, I, th I would say the answer is it depends. You know, I think that the, the risk of not taking a risk is usually the highest risk. <laughs> and, and I say that living in Switzerland where people are, you know, the word risk has to be spelled out to them. Um, so not to say anything bad about Switzerland, it's a great place. But, but this is also why you have a lot of things still functioning in Switzerland. Right? So I think the answer really is there. It usually pays to, to, uh, to try a lot of things and fail quick and fail fast and fail cheap. Mm. I guess that's the basis of innovation, isn't it, really taking risks? and, and Well, I, let's put it this way. I mean, I think that, that I would leave the big failures like Google Glass to, to Google <laughs> uh, and MySpace. Uh, and so on, and I would probably see if I can fail quickly. I mean, I, I tried all, all, like, you know, I tried using Apple TV this morning to present to you guys, and it was a failure, so, so I did spend a couple of hundred bucks for nothing, but I, it was a quick failure where you say, okay, I got it, you know, it's not working. So fail fast, fail quick, fail cheap, try again. Right? That's kind of the best way forward, I think. Would you see uh, risk-averse companies actually shying away from this because there's a high risk of failure? Um, technology is notorious for failing. We saw another classic example this morning for those of you who were in the overflow room where the link failed and people just couldn't get in to see Sugata's keynote. So is it, is it a problem for some companies? Would they be risk, if they're risk averse, would it mean that they would be at a disadvantage? In most cases, I think it would. I think the, in general, the fact is that we're moving ever faster on this highway of information and technology, right? So we're going from uh, going 100 miles an hour to going 800 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. But most companies are looking in the back mirror, right, to figure out, oh, yeah, it used to be like this, and at the same time speeding up, mm -hmm. you know, that leads to accidents, of course. Right? So you crash because mm -hmm. you're, you're looking in the back the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And that could be extremely dangerous. Having said that, you know, sometimes for some companies, they, they have more of a runway. Mm -hmm. Or a safety net. So <laughs> so yeah, so or more money, for that matter. So it's better to be um, an early adopter, perhaps, than, than a late majority in, in Roger's uh, model. Well, that's what this way. I think in three years, this whole question is moot, right? Because mm -hmm. technology is becoming so powerful, mm -hmm. the question is no longer if, you know, if this works, or how it works, or how we're going to pay for it. These questions will be gone. Because mm -hmm. the answer is yes, it works. Yes, it's cheap. Yes, we can do it. The question will be, why do we do this? Right? I, why? I, I actually tweeted uh, something you said earlier on, and it's had a bit of a reaction out on, on the Twitter sphere. What you said was um, the biggest mistake that companies make is, is um, investing in the now rather than planning for, for what might be in the future. But that's, that's a huge statement to make, and, and many people here and, and outside might be asking, how do we know what's coming next to be able to, to plan for it? It's not hard. You know, it's, I think it's hard if you're talking about 2030 or so. Mm -hmm. But the things that are going to happen in five years, you, everyone in the room knows what they are. You have to take the time to look at them. You but do we, though? I mean, it, that's five years down the road. It's quite a long time in technology, isn't it? How, how, how do we know? Well, we can, we can get some votes here. I mean, let's, let's ask a simple mm, question. Yeah. Right? Who in this room does not believe that electric cars and partially self-driving cars will become a real reality in the next five to ten years? Is there anybody in this room that agrees that self-driving or electric cars are not the future or will, will not happen? Anybody? No? Well, let's put, put your hands up if you, if you think in the next five years that there'll be uh, a, a massive electric cars on the road. Mm, yeah, maybe 50-50. We can't really gauge without, you know, metrics. The rest is just too shy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, there, there's lots of things that we know. We just have to, mm. we have to be able to face it, right? Mm. So it takes a certain duality. And this is very important for our future. We have to be able to think mm. in, in two levels, right? The now mm. level and the tomorrow level. And then we have to bring them together. 
and this, this takes a bit of practice, but, you know, basically being able to imagine what it would be if you didn't do this, this is an essential skill, mm -hmm. and that can be trained. So planning for the future is really important, even if you don't really know what the future might be. This is the message. Um, in the front here is a, a question. Uh, perhaps we could... Um, you're going to be <laughs> exhausted <laughs> running around with the microphone. Can, can, I ask, can I answer this quick tweet? Because I do want to yeah. respond to a tweet yeah. after I said that I would. Just real quick, right? Well, we're, we're waiting for this. Okay, so... Okay. Um, uh, well, parents are wondering can... what skills will be essential in the future. So parents are wondering what skills will be essential in the This is from future. Charlie Cheng. Uh, it's not you. <laughs> it would have been <laughs> interesting. But... Parents are wondering what skills, well, it's quite clearly, it's those skills that are uniquely human. So, so things like creativity, what else? Well, I mean, there, there's, there's dozens, you know, th those used to be the ones that we tried to get rid of in school. <laughs> you know, uh, asking questions, uh, putting stuff together, imaginative things, coming up with fantasy things, coming up with games, uh, being playful, experimenting, negotiating, discussion, therapy, cooking, yeah. How about flexibility and being adaptable to change? Yeah, all those things yeah. that machines will never do. I mean, if you ask a self-driving car to make an ethical decision, who they're going to crash into, right? You don't want that because if they did, they would kill us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question from the front here. Uh, in, in line with the discussion, what are the biggest barriers? Because if you see what's happening now, uh, in many companies, technology comes from the outside and inside they fail and they fail again to have a learning management system. All the other kind of culture is against it, security of data, m mindset, everything else. So. Uh, Talking about those cars, for example, it might take another 20 years mm. because Google Glass is stopping, because there's other things happening around. There's so many dimensions who are, who are not a positive condition for that automation or that uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a quote, I forgot who said it, it said that if you think that uh, change is a pain, try irrelevance. And if you, if you work with companies and say, you know, those are your choices, so you, you can do this and get into it and, and go through that pain of change, which is painful, or you can just become re irrelevant. Look what happens in the newspaper business. Right? Now they're figuring out, yeah, may, maybe I wasn't relevant to begin with. You know, now I find out that I, I don't matter anymore. So this is the worst. And I think when people realize that this is the case, then they have motivation. You have to look for motivation. And there's only two motivations, really. One is you're about to die or you have serious issues, right? You, you have pain, and the second one is you fall in love with an idea, right? You're, you're completely blown away by this concept. That's really the motivations for people and for companies. If you don't have that, the rest is just intellectual playground, you know? Saying, yeah, it would be nice, but, you know, why? Just wondering how many of you can think of other companies that fell by the wayside because they didn't adapt to change or didn't innovate. I'm thinking of Kodak for one, and, and also Blockbuster, which I believe was offered, um, um, what was the company? Um, uh, they, were, they were offered Netflix, um, Netflix yeah. uh, to, to, uh, and they refused to buy into it. It's like the man who turned down the Beatles, isn't it, really? Well, the best thing to yeah. do if you work for a company that has those issues, right, is to make clear what the motivating factors are. Mm -hmm. And say, this is, this is what's happening. If you take a look out here, you see what's happening. I mean, Airbnb could have been invented by Hilton, by Hilton Hotels, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, a, it's technology, it's a database, right? Mm. Uh, so, if you do that, then you have motivation. Then you get, you get concerned, people are concerned, not just intellectually, the rest is just spreadsheets. You know? Nobody does anything because of spreadsheets. That's just fodder to make an argument for what you want to do anyway. Okay. I wonder, is it Hans, is it? I, I don't know everyone's names in the room, don't worry. <laughs> I, I'm a connected. Um, Hans, uh, could you pass the mic over to the lady over here? Thank you. Oh, that's okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Steve, you mentioned about or asked about uh, which companies uh, where are you? went out of business because oh, they didn't adapt. I think BlackBerry is a good example of that, where they just sort of kept on with the same model. And uh, obviously, they, they're still going, but it, it, they really um, went downhill quite significantly because they didn't adapt to the new technology. And I still don't think they're, they're right there where they need to be. Well, it's a little bit, mm -hmm. I think many companies have this issue to where they're observing from the outside. So, for example, I go to quite a few companies, big companies, who are saying, you know, we want to use social media because it looks like it's great marketing. And then I go to their computer and we look at something and you can't go on Facebook because it's blocked on the company network, right? They want to use what they're blocking because they're outside of this. They're not actually, in th they're, they're, it's like a role play for them, right? And if you do that, you want to learn how to swim without getting wet. You know, it's not going to happen, right? 
So first thing you have to do is you have to get wet, you have to get real. You don't do that by looking from the outside, say, yeah, it looks interesting, let me watch this YouTube clip, you know. It's an approximation of reality, it's not real. So you have to, you have to throw people in first, so they can figure out what's actually happening. We probably have time for one or two more quick questions before we break for lunch. Are there any other pressing questions? Let's see what the... Uh, uh, Let's have a look at Twitter and see, what, see what's on Let's there. Let's see what um, the uh, demonic Twitter machine <laughs> provides. Has anyone tweeted in a question on Twitter? It says, get off the stage. No, no. It's a good one. Well, um, perhaps, uh, is it, uh, perhaps you could actually ask your question live if we can't... Um, we need the microphone just there, thank you. A couple of your slides mentioned the democratization of learning. Could you give us your thoughts of what you believe it democratization of learning is about? <laughs> well, that's a question we'll take all day for that. Uh, yeah. I think there's a democratization happening because of technology is becoming more available, you know, like everything else, really. At the same time, you can argue that uh, technology has also brought a concentration of power for example, with the big internet companies, you know, what we used to call big oil is now big internet, basically. Um, so those are both happening at the same time. I think democratization has been vastly overused as a term. What happens here, it becomes more available, it becomes more disseminated, it becomes easier to do and cheaper to do, and that's a good thing. At the same time, it doesn't do away with experts. It doesn't do away with with people who know exactly what they're doing, just like people who can, you know, use the iPhone to record a conversation aren't going to sound as good as the professional producer. This is just a different level of, of, uh, of reach. Right? So democratization to me does not mean that we don't need the experts, we don't need the people that, that have that knowledge. The opposite is actually true. Uh, in some cases, like banking, for example, yes, we don't need all that stuff that they sold us for a lot of money and that will hurt them. Right? will need them to move up the food chain. Right? As I said earlier, if you do something that's repetitive, that can be democratized away by software, that will happen. And then you have to pick new grounds. Right? That, that, that's inevitable, that's happening everywhere. And learning is just on the beginning of this. I mean, learning is where television and, and movies and, and music was at 10 years ago. Learning is at this point to where we're just about to see what can happen here. Let's take Wikipedia as an example. Would that be democracy in, in action, do you think? Jeez, I, <laughs> I kind of doubt it. Good <laughs> questions. Well, I love Wikipedia, but it's, it's a whole different discussion. I think that mm, yeah. everything has a window. Uh -huh. Wikipedia had a nice window, and they still have a window, but, but this was, of course, this came out of the well, you know, San Francisco, mm, mm, yeah. democratization mm. thinking. Now we're at a whole different level of this. Mm. Um, I think it would, be, it would be a mistake to replace the wisdom of the crowd I mean, to take, to take the expertship of people who are very good at this and replace it with the wisdom of the crowd, you know. Uh, they actually work very nicely together. Mm. Well, Jimmy Wells uh, claims that actually a lot of the people who contribute to Wikipedia are in fact experts and have degrees in the subject. So, so there's a mix of novices and experts. Well, I'll give you too. a simple story from my life. I was mm. deleted from Wikipedia. Were you? Uh, years, I, frankly, I don't, I don't care, but uh, you know what the argument was? I wasn't well known enough to be on Wikipedia. Right? I mean, my, my garbage can is on Wikipedia. Right? <laughs> so I don't know why I think this was some sort of internal strife about what I was saying yeah. at that time that somebody deleted me. And ever since then, I've been deleted. And so, not that I care, <laughs> but this gives you an example that, you know, democracies have problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's just the way it is. So that doesn't mean Wikipedia is bad. Yeah. That's just. It's not flawless, but we have different things now. I mean, we have, we have giant depositories of information and knowledge and discussion, and this is just the beginning. So I think we're going to go way beyond Wikipedia on this. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, uh, I, I think the, I hope you've all enjoyed this presentation. For you. I certainly have, and I could sit and listen to him all day. Unfortunately, we can't. We've run out of time, but um, I think uh, I, you ought to show your appreciation to him. Thank you, Gerd. Thank you. Thank you.